Troy Bayless here, three times world chump. I'm here at the Physical Performance Show. And the winner is failure is not an option. I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show. The show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Welcome listeners to another episode of the Physical Performance Show, the show that takes you behind the curtain of the lives of the world's best physical performers. In today's episode, you're in for a real treat. I've got Troy Bayless with me, and this is an interview I've been looking to have for some time. So Troy and I, Troy and I are sitting down together, having a fireside chat about the highs and the lows of Troy's extraordinary career. And by way of sporting biography, have a listen to this, the fastest man on two wheels, Superbike world champion three times, British superbike champion, uh, victorious MotoGP race in his career, and an incredible 52 world superbike victories. Uh, at the time of print, when I've done my research, second only to Carl Fogarty. So Troy may update us on uh, any biography changes as we kick off here. So Troy, welcome along to the Physical Performance Show. Brad, it's great to be here and uh, I'm really looking forward to our chat. So, Troy, I like to start with something that's a little bit out of the gates, and uh, and that is, what's the number one thing, or what's something that scares you? A bloke that's lived his life at high speed, what's something that uh, scares you, Troy? Um, that's an easy one, actually. Um, I, I love to win. Uh, I'm scared of losing. Uh, it's, I know that sounds strange, but... Um, that's it. I don't like to fail in the things that I set out to do normally. So what is it about, you know, uh, failure that you want to avoid? (laughs) Um, It's just like, I guess you could, if I look back on uh, the world championships, I mean, I used to love winning races and sometimes for me, um, I I knew I was going to crash out and I was riding above my head sometimes and and I knew it could possibly affect the the world championship, but like when I got a sniff of a win, um, it was hard to hold myself back. And there were situations where I knew that I could have finished third or fourth, and it would have been great for the points. But I knew there's a chance for a win, and it ha- actually happened to me uh, in 2008 one time, for instance, at um, in Ballalunga in Rome, and uh, I. I could have won the championship on that day. All I had to do was finish in front of Norrie Hargo and we had a couple of laps to go and we were going hell for leather and uh, I thought I could do it and a long story short, I crashed out with like two corners to go. So that left it to another race before I could wrap the championship up and uh, that was in Magni Corps in France and uh, and there I did settle for the first race to, for a third or something to actually win the championship and then went out and won the second race, just put the head down, there's nothing to lose and I've done that quite a few times. Like the championship is the icing on the cake um, but you can, just can't beat winning races. And uh, in your career, there was 52. Is that number accurate? Yeah, I think that's that's about right. Um, I think the percentage rate was around about, out of all the starts I did, I think in the end it worked out to be a 32 or a 33% win rate, basically. Yeah, which when I researched, uh, if my research is accurate, I mean, we're talking about... The stats: 152 listeners starts um, on a on a on a starting line. 52 wins, uh, 94 podiums, and uh, 26 poles. Uh, and that's just, I mean, their stats that any athlete would love. Yeah, no, they they were really good. Um, I do say though, I've, I've been riding Ducati since uh, the year 2000 in the British Superbike Championship. I spent basically most of my career there as a professional. And uh, I do believe that I had such a great team working around me. I had the best guys. I had a very good relationship with them. That's so important. Yep. Um, I have been in the situations in the past where I rode actually a Honda in 2005 in MotoGP. It was a Camel Honda at the time. And um, it was just one year away from Ducati's. And I went in with a Spanish team, a great team, but like the communication wasn't good. And it was one of them situations where you completely don't feel 
good and you feel left out and nothing works and uh, it ended badly just with a training accident with a badly broken wrist and I sat out the rest of the year and um, yeah when when you're working with a team and everybody especially the main guy that you have to speak to your engineer he understands you and can understand and, and get what I'm actually telling him about with the bike because basically like you know motorbike riders we're not engineers <laughs> you have engineers and uh some really classy people working around you but it's you know sometimes numbers don't make sense and sometimes it's a bit of a black art and it's hard to to get that the feeling out of the driver or the rider to make the good connection between the bike and the team and put it all together on the track so when you say uh black art troy um you mean communication amongst the stakeholders in the team is that what you're referring to uh, yes but also with the setting of the bike like um the motorcycle so different to a car i mean on the bike you can move your body weight around which is a big percentage of the bike and basically um there's so many things you can do to try and make the bike better for you and like sometimes on the paper it might look good you know spring right here or click here do this but sometimes uh what i'm trying to say is sometimes what should work in theory doesn't work it's just all about what makes the the guy on the bike happy and like we used to like sometimes laugh and say we don't care if you put triangle wheels in yeah. as long as i'm going fast it doesn't matter so, so <laughs> it's a really difficult one so to it's explain art, art and science oh yeah for yeah. sure yeah. and lots of times um and it happens with everybody in every sport i think you sometimes wake up and like my boss or my manager at a time he used to say okay who we got today which he used to say i had a twin brother so it'd be Kim and Daryl would always be joking, <laughs> have we got Kevin today or have we got the real Kevin? Uh, most of the time I was on the ball, but, you know, there was times where you just weren't with it. And, yeah. like, even um, our team <laughs> boss, David Tadotzi, he, he, used to, he was an ex-rider and a great rider, and he was actually very good for me, and he could see it in me as well. And, you know, he could see when I wasn't relaxed or I looked tense. And, it, you know, it's such a fast sport, and um, – it is very physical as well, but you have to basically ride the bike like a piano and it's, um, it's very light inputs and uh, it's, you have to be relaxed and you have to be comfortable and you have to be uh, feeling, feeling just confident. You have to believe in yourself so much. You have to be so confident in yourself but actually believe it. There were so many times where David used to say to me, you know, I know you're fast, you know you're fast, but you just don't believe it yet. And we were saying that even after I'd won my first world championship um, you worked so hard and it happened just say in 2001 and, and the British Championship in 99 but it wasn't until around about 2006 and I was getting on by then, I was 35 or 36 that's, that my, I really... that's my age now Troy so thanks a lot mate <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's far from over the hill but it wasn't until then before I really understood myself properly which is, sounds crazy and actually started training properly as well all right, we've got, to, we've got to dig deeper on this. Mm. Before we dig deeper on what you just said there about understanding yourself as a peak physical performer, as an athlete, um, just for listeners, you speak about going fast. Give, give listeners a bit of an idea into the speeds involved as you're racing at your peak on these bikes. Yeah, so I guess um, if we look at the slowest corner at nearly all of the tracks, it would probably be around between 60 and 75 kilometres an hour at the apex, so that's the slowest the slowest slowest point and you'd only be there for a fraction of a second so you'd be breaking in from whatever speed um for instance at monza you might be doing 320 you break into the first chicane so it's an incredible it's like um it's like you're in a push-up but somebody's sitting on your back and so that's what the braking forces are like Mm. and so you have to do that take that on your arms and on your hands but also on your legs like have your legs wrapped around the tank because if you don't use your legs like that just puts more weight on your arms so we used to put like um like grip tape and all sorts of things all over the bike in different places to give you a bit better grip to try and save some of the other parts on your body but there's tracks where well my fastest like was at barcelona uh that was 347 and like even at Phillip Island, like sometimes it's 323 down the straight with a little bit of a tailwind. <laughs> it's fast, but it actually doesn't feel fast. So, so describe that. Like uh, the, the fastest I've ever been in a in a mechanical machine yeah. was with a mutual friend of ours, Tim Slade, who's another yeah. show guest on this, <laughs> and he took me out to the Ipswich Raceway and all the, all the Queensland Raceway and did a few hot laps with me, and and uh, and 
you know, I got a sense of, okay, you got a sense of, okay, this, if you live and breathe this, it kind of would become your norm. Yeah. I mean, I was, my face was, you know, back near my ears when we took off. But so how does it, describe how it doesn't feel fast at 347 kilometers an hour up, up Yeah, the I know. And I've done the same with Tim and I've done it with a few guys. And um, when you go out in the car like that and you're going down the straight and you're waiting for the guys to put the brakes on, you feel like putting your foot straight through the floor pan, don't you? Yeah. It's, um, it's just an incredible feeling, but it is what you get used to and uh, it just comes comes naturally and when you're driving down the down the track to say you're doing 200 or 250 and you've got a bike beside you doing the same speed or well, it's like us sitting here they might be coming past you another two kilometers an hour faster or, or vice versa so you, you can put your hand out and touch them or it's not until it actually goes wrong and but i mean the racetracks these days like are getting better every year there's a lot of runoff so even when you do crash um, normally it's pretty good unless you actually hit something and when you do crash if, if you just say you're doing 200 well your bike's sliding at the same at the same speed so it's, it is pretty rare that you, you get hurt and and it does sound funny but normally the faster you go you don't want to get too fast but like crashing at 80 kilometers an hour is worse than crashing at 160 because at 160 it's like skimming a rock across the pond so unless there's a wall on the other side of the pond yeah it's normally better whereas at 80 you, you tend to especially if you have a high side where the back lets go and grips in and throws you up over the bike yep. where you're coming down with less speed and that's where the accidents happen like broken collarbones and and lots of stuff like that the best crash to have though always is to lose the front and um, because you're already on the way into the corner on the brakes uh you've got a lot of angle on the bike and people would love to have that experience just to see <laughs> just to realize like how how good they are unless when you sometimes you can hit the gravel trap and and an arm or a leg might dig into the gravel and start you know tumble which is yeah. yeah which is you know can end in tears but in general it's not so bad so i mean i look at these look at you guys coming off and you know my experience of coming off things on wheels has been in uh, on, on road bikes cycle bikes and triathlon bikes you know and as a kid that didn't go so well for me with brain hemorrhages and fractured bones and you know no skin but so what's the what's the the worst accident troy you've had in your you know in your, in your significant career uh it's a very difficult one and i agree with you i've got more skin off me from bicycles than the motorcycle um but you know every year i broke something it might be a finger or a hand or a wrist or a kneecap or an ankle or sometimes you might actually to tell you the truth though i've hurt myself more in the last three or four years like racing dirt track than I did in my whole career so the last crash I had last year I broke um collarbone some ribs vertebrae and a Bennett's fracture which had to be operated on here in the same crash where I hit a wall and it's I was, I was lucky I got out of the sport I can still do all my training and and that was like one of the big things I was actually really always thinking about because I love the bicycle so much I wanted to finish my career in one piece and and be able to ride and do coffee shop rides for the rest of my life yeah and luckily that's happened and listen as Troy's referring to the you know road cycling which uh we want to get to because uh I have a little bit of backstory on uh on your uh the early start of your career we want to go there and understand how because I believe you could have taken a, a fork or maybe potentially one or two ways Troy just before we divert into that you said it took you at about 30 to the age of 35 or thereabouts when you started to feel like you understood yourself as an athlete what do you can you explain that a little bit more basically i think i've overtrained myself right from when i first started and right up until when i hooked up with um his name was lee bryan uh, colin rock he was a trainer overseas trained a lot of cyclists and um he's still doing that now but i i just overdid everything so even on thursday before the race i'd go out and do a couple of hours or three hours on the bicycle or basically always too much bicycle and especially as you start to get older, you, you know, you need the body needs a bit more recovery and you need to be a bit smarter, especially with eating. When I was younger, I'd eat anything but just train like a madman. Mm. And um, I was always super fit, but I think I, I left too much of it out there in the training. And uh, I really got it together in the last few years of my career. So you started to pull a few of those what you felt weren't important pieces to your performance together. Yeah, and we started to highlight and, and do sp- specific exercises that... Uh, we knew we're going to transfer across to the motorcycle and and i still got them in the back of my head now and i'm actually doing some of those now and just getting started because there's a few races that i want to do this year and um yeah i know what i need to do and it's just a matter of getting motivated but you know i had my time and and i had a great career so 
if I want to come back and ride fast, I know I need to do a bit of training that goes with it. So, Troy, when you did shift into that more rounded athlete, did you notice your performance changed? Oh, I was definitely I was a better athlete, that's for sure. Uh, I think I was actually more confident in myself as well. And, um, yeah, it just we did all the things that we needed to do. Uh, even, for instance, the last, the last year, my last year when I retired and won the championship in 2008, um, I crashed at Phillip Island in the pre-season test and broke my collarbone and it was only five weeks out till um, the first race in Qatar so I hung about here for a couple of weeks and, and rested up and just did a, you know some very light stuff and then went straight to Qatar and based myself there before the race and I, I, I wasn't strong at all by the start of the race but you know I was in the gym doing little bits and pieces and and uh, we ended up winning the first race and it was a brand new bike as well and there was myself and Max Biaggi and we both were on Ducatis and he was on the same bike and we both wanted to win so badly and I wanted to win on the new bike and it was I wanted to win that year so badly because I'd already won on the like three different um, makes of the Ducati like the 996, the 999 and then finally the, the 1098 and that was so important to me. Yeah, well, and was Biaggi, you mentioned Biaggi, was he one of your, uh, over the years, a few, you know, incredible duels that you guys had? Yeah, yeah, he was always a hard man, especially for me in Superbike, and we, we spoke, but we were, like, really, um, really hard against one another on the track, and it's funny how it goes, like, so many of the people that, you know, were big adversaries in the past, now you get on so much better with, it's crazy, I think every sport is like that, yeah. and uh, it's certainly... My life since I, I stopped racing, um, like as a pro, you could say, it's it's so relaxed now. I never used to sleep very good. I was always, I couldn't, um, I just couldn't rest or I couldn't stop thinking about it. Like it was, I guess you could say, excessive, compulsive. Mm. Like I wanted to race, I wanted to win, and I'd train, do everything right, arrive at the race, and then I just couldn't wait. Like I'd arrive there on Thursday or Wednesday, and then, like, from the moment I got to the track, all I wanted to do was get the racing over and done with. And then, like, a good weekend or a bad weekend, normally they were pretty good. And that feeling would only last for a few hours. And then it was back on the plane home to back to wherever we were in Europe and um, back into the training again. So it was a bit of a vicious circle. Yeah. It was but, a I weird mean, one. Listen to you describe that, Troy. It just sounds like, uh, you know, the top 1%. <sighs> performers or achievers in any given endeavor sport whatever it may be it's almost like that fanatical discipline you described it as obsessive compulsive that i think really is a big differentiator would you agree from yeah well from good performance to 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 you know to best you know to 52 victories out of 152 starts i think so i think you have to be a little bit different yeah, yeah. I've, I've really been known as um like quite a normal guy you know like i think um one of the things that was very good for me was I'd already had, um, like, Kim and I were childhood sweethearts, like, just out of school. Because we Kim, Kim's your wife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so we already had, like, um, Mitchell and Abby. They were very young, like, when I was racing here in Australia and went over to, to, to England first. And so I always had, like, Kim's, like, like been really good. You know, she's seen me at my best, my worst, and mm. she's been, like, you could nearly say my psychiatrist. <laughs> She's seen that she's seen everything and um, there's been times where she's pushed me out the door to go training especially in the UK when we first went there but I mean I don't know how it would have turned out without Kim because she's been such a yeah like a massive driving force behind me yeah and did I, I think I might have seen recently you guys just celebrated a wedding anniversary or did I yeah yeah right? no it wasn't too long ago yeah, yeah. how so many years are we talking that about that is 22 so listen as you can't uh, you can't see this but Troy's here in front of me and I shake his hand <laughs> I'm uh, seven years eight years into the journey and so uh, anyone that's uh, got up to, to that I think it's, it's incredible mate so yeah, obviously no. that shows a, a great depth in yeah yeah for sure you know in, in the journey and the relationship um, Troy on on significant others uh, over the years you've obviously you mentioned your relationship at the start of the interview with you know your team yeah um who else has played a significant role in your career over the years in terms of uh well apart from kim and daryl daryl healy he was um he had a private ducati team which i ended up winning the championship for uh in 97 i did a wild card race here in the 250 gp it was just a one-off thing i was just coming back off some um crack vertebrae and it was my first ride back, and, and it was the Australian Grand Prix. Uh, the Japanese rider was sick, and 
um, just through what you know, who you know, the guy that did the suspension on my 600, um, he was doing the suspension for the for this Suzuki team, the Molinar Suzuki team, and he put my name forward, and finally this happened. So I ended up doing a really good race down there, and there was um, Bill Woods and Barry Sheen in the commentary box, and everyone was just shocked. I finished six, but I was very close to the front, and I was like 67 kilos, too big for a 250, and um, they took me up there, and where everyone was just wow what's happening now like I should you know <laughs> you're thinking something, you're going to be taken by a top team and nothing come out of it we, we realised that even back then people were like paying for rides and you know like I could have been on a 500 or a 250 but the minimum was about 250,000 US and like I didn't even know anyone that had that much money um, this is in what year Troy? this is in 97 yeah yeah and then it was only a week or so later I had a phone call and it was Daryl who we didn't know from Bar of Soap, and he said, would you like to come and race the British Superbike Championship for our for me? And Kim and I just looked at each other and went, why not? We'd treat it as a working, a working holiday, which we'd never seen anything overseas, and that's how it all took off. So Daryl was very, very good for us. Yeah. Uh, rode for him, won the championship, the British Championship for Daryl, and became very good friends, and he's been looking after me as far as management all through my career. And never taken a cent off me, so that's a crazy manager. Wow, that's that's incredible. Yep. So he he right through your career was there, and yep. Uh, yep. and and that was never a commercial arrangement. No, he um, his long term goal was to race in World Superbike, um, but it was happening too slowly. So after I won the championship, I had a chance to race for Ducati um, for the factory Ducati team in the US, and Daryl said you should do that, Troy, because like. It's not happening here for me to go to World Superbike. So I went there. Yep. I was only there for four months to race Daytona and Sears Point. And um, Carl Fogarty, who was the, the main rider of the world champion, he's got the most wins ever. He crashed at Phillip Island and um, injured himself bad, which was the end of his career, basically. And um, Colin, another <laughs> supporter, my first sponsor, who actually gave me a credit card to give me free petrol and uh, accommodation, a local guy from Taree, still a great friend, like... It's, it's been Colin, Daryl, and Kim. Yeah, wow. Well, that's been it, basically. But Colin that, rang me and said, Troy, I bet they're going to call you. And like a few hours later, David Tarotzi calls me, who I didn't really know. He said, Troy, get on a plane, come to Japan, see you there. That's basically it. Yeah. And um, I knew David because he was like, high up in Ducati, but I was riding for Vance and Hines Ducati in America, which was a factory team, but I was meant to be there for a year or two. So this all sort of happened, you know, the invitation to go over and race for Daryl with Daryl off yep. the back of That's, that, that, come that, that the breakthrough back of that. performance yeah. yep one right? breakthrough performance yeah. yep. which was at Phillip Island yep which yep. was at Phillip Island yep and so so if you had to across your career Troy pick one one uh, one event or one outcome or one achievement as your, your greatest what would it be if you could only pick one? I know that's a hard question because we're looking at a, a pretty impressive stat list. Uh, yeah, there's one coming up not long after this part, and it was only like five seconds of what I did like, that said you're not going anywhere, and then I spent the next eight years or nine years with Ducati. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, okay, so can you pick a one, pick one race? Yeah, it was Monza. Monza. Tell Monza us about in, that. Monza in 2000. So this was in 2000 when I was racing in America. Um, I turned up at Japan. And um, the guys, it was so last minute.com, didn't have time to get anything ready, so we're ripping Fogarty's name off. It literally was last minute.com, or you just, you just say that locally? <laughs> no, no, it was like like a few days before. Yeah, okay, yeah, got it. So, so yeah. jump on the plane, and um, off I went. We arrived there <laughs> myself, and uh, met the guys at the airport, and you know, it was pretty, you know, hello, whatever. And we arrived at the track and met the mechanics, Gino, and uh, a few of the guys who end up being such good friends of mine. And um, we were, they were peeling Fogarty's name off his leathers, like, because um, I had to get into a set, and he was a bit smaller than me as well. Um, but anyway, that race, I didn't finish one lap of both races. Um, there was a pile up at turn one I was in, and then in the second race, um, I got taken out by uh, a Japanese guy there on about a third corner. So I left there with my tail between my legs and and uh, pretty upset. Big long story between Kim was still in America and uh, all bits and pieces that had to be sorted. It was just a nightmare. So I headed back to, I think we met in Australia. And um, the next round for the World Superbikes was at Donington Park and they decided to put Luca Catalora on the bike. He was an Italian champion. And I just 
lost it because I just won the British Championship. I know Donington Park like the back of my hand. Yep. They put Luca on it, and he he had a really hard weekend. Didn't do any good, and because Ducati was one of the top teams, they had the world champion Carl Fogarty. They were at wit's end. They were a bit lost, and so they rang they rang Daryl, and Daryl spoke to Kim and said they want Troy back on the bike at Monza, and I said no, no way, I don't want to do that. Um, Anyway, Daryl and Kim, you know, used their brains and sorted it out. <laughs> and I uh, found myself back at Monza. Kim was packing up the kids um, to go back to the US. And I turned up at Monza. And um, what I did, I was running about fifth, did a pretty good job. But I did one pass, like I went like down the straight, which I say Monza is like 310, yeah. like into the first chicane. I went from fifth to first, did one pass. The people went crazy. I finished fourth and then fifth in the races. And that was it. They said... You're not going back to America. Tell Kim so she can go back to England for a while until we get organised. And that was... Uh, this, is like, this is like when I say mafia. Yeah, yeah. It's just like, that's what you're doing. And uh, I wanted to do that anyway. That was like what I've been wanting to do for years. Like as soon as I realised I was fast, I wanted Fogarty's job. Right. He handed me the trophy when I won the championship in England in 99. And as he was handing it to me, like he presented the trophy for the British championship. And I was just think- as he was giving that to me, I was thinking... I'm having your job one day. Wow. So, so that is, is that a moment where your confidence really, yeah, you really start? Because you mentioned at the start of the interview, you know, the podcast here that it's all about belief. It's all about belief. But is, that gave me, because I did a wild card as well in England in 98 against the World Superbox because they come to Brands Hatch. And it was my first year. And when they arrived, it was my first time. Well, no, it wasn't the first time. But anyway, I was up against them guys and did okay. So I knew I wasn't too far off. Yeah. And the experience I gained in the UK was it was always good. You certainly learned to ride in the rain over there as well. Yeah, right. So um, the next race was at um, Hockenheim in Germany, really fast track, and we went there. I was absolutely full of the flu and had my first race win and um, for in World Superbikes, and that was incredible. And so you, you, you'd gone to that race from Britain? Uh, from yep, because you'd moved from the US back to I went back to the UK. Yep, to the UK. Sorry, yep. back to the UK. Stayed somewhere. I can't even remember now. <laughs> Kim was still sorting out everything. Yeah, like yep. from from with, America with Kim, the kids in tow as well. Yeah, Kim yep. didn't make it back for Hockenheim. Yeah, and um, it was just like really emotional as well because I was there by myself. I didn't know the team really. I'd only met them like uh, two weeks before, yep. and to uh, to come away from there like winning my first race in the world championship was just like. Didn't even really understand it, but so, I was certainly happy. And what, how old were you at that stage, Troy? I would have been... I was a late starter. It's really yeah. weird, but yeah. I was 23. Yeah, yeah. I know. No, sorry. I was about 28 or 9. Okay, that's all right. Yeah. Six years. What's that, right? Yeah, it's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, okay, so 28, 29, getting your first uh, podium. Yep. Uh, Kim is back in the US trying to sort stuff out. Yeah. You were yep. there by yourself. You said it was really quite emotional. What was what was going through your head when you stood on the podium and were awarded the trophy? It's just like I re- finally realised that, like I was sort of world class. Mm. Like I always knew I was fast, but once I won that and how I seen how the team and how how everybody around me was affected, it was like very. I knew I was sort of could win again, yeah. and I knew that like that was my life basically changing for sure at that moment. Yeah, describe the conversation you had with Kim. You can recall. <laughs> That's a difficult one. I can't even really remember. And all I know is we, we moved back to, um, we based ourselves when we first went to the UK between Coventry and Birmingham. Right. And so we knew a lot of people there. So we, we just found another house there and rented a house. Yep. And it wasn't too long. They went, okay. David said, right, you've signed up now. Well, that year was done. So we used that um, between Daryl and Kim. He Daryl come up with a plan, like he's a big businessman and he said this is what's going to happen he said we treat because we had we're about a the championship was always around about a third into the championship when Carl was injured so Daryl said okay you know the English tracks um we're going to learn some tracks this year new tracks like throughout Europe so so we'll treat it as a learning year next year the winning championship 2002 win it again or do what you can do and then we go home Um, so that was the plan we set out yeah and um it wasn't long before the end of 2000 David's been around for years and said right you're moving to Monaco took us to Monaco and just some people found a place down there and we moved down there and then 2001 it was like 
it was just full on and um, we ended up winning the championship. Yeah, right. uh, that was all great. 2002 started out like like I was in the perfect place living down the south of France yep. for training and in, everything. In it was Monaco. incredible. In Monaco? Yeah, yeah, it was great. Because uh, I haven't been to Monaco, but from what I know through um, you know, people like yourself and a few other guys, it's, it's, it's athletes, it's a bit of a, a mecca for... Every, like for anything, like yeah. sports people, like anything goes in Monaco. You can walk down the street like in boardies and flip-flops. Or, or you can walk down there like Elvis and no one will look twice. <laughs> it doesn't matter. So Elvis is alive. <laughs> but, you know, there's was, there was quite a few Aussies living there, um, sports people, and it was just the place to be. It was perfect. Good weather. Yeah, right. And Kim was uh, Kim and the kids were happy in Yeah, Monica. they were pretty happy there. We, we basically started off, it was like living in Broken Hill. We started in the back street of Monaco because mm. uh, it's only a you know, couple of kilometres long and less than a, a kilometre deep down to the ocean. So um, we were there for a few years before we moved down and then, uh, you know, life just comes a bit more busy when you're down by the water. But we had a few <laughs> years of working ourselves into it, that's for sure. <laughs> and, uh, and Troy, let's just talk about how you got started in, you know, in, 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 the, motorbike, in the, the world that you, you know, have, have lived in for so long because the limited knowledge I have from a mutual friend was that Troy had a decision to make where you really, I think you had a breakthrough win on the bicycle in road racing uh and you were you know uh at a, really at elite level you know uh, not yet professional on a, on a bicycle but you're at a level where you could have potentially gone down that path uh was that is that is that sort of story inside i have accurate in that you were you know we, but it's a little bit yeah. yeah well like the bicycle is my passion yeah and um of course you know growing up everybody rides a bicycle and i grew up like from four or five riding bicycles and motorbikes yeah and this is in taree this is like New South uh, Wales. taree then warrialda way out west on a wheat farm okay so every day i was on on bicycle or motorbike um then through school i did junior motocross and um dirt track up until i was around about 15 years old yep and then you know of course it's a bit expensive so that come to an end and um just did my normal you know normal school thing with my mates and and hung out uh i became an apprentice painter you know in a panel beating shop yep i ended up doing 10 years of that but uh, I lost my license, my P plates, nothing serious, but uh, yeah. I had to go to work, so I bought a bicycle. Yep. And I used to ride to work, it was about 7Ks, ride home for lunch, ride back to work, and then ride home. And like I say, I'm a bit excessive compulsive, I'll be flat <laughs> out the whole time. So it got me going, and then uh, it was Nick Gates, he came along and started his apprenticeship uh, at the same place. And he said, You should come out for a ride with us <laughs> like 5 o'clock in the morning. Okay, I did that, and that was it. I got hooked on bicycles. <laughs> And I've done that ever since. And um, I used to go pretty good. And I actually believed that, yeah. like, I could have actually maybe made that for my profession. Yeah. But I knew I was, I was, uh, you know, I had motorcycles. Like, I knew I was fast on the bike. And it wasn't mm. until when I had my own money and I bought a road bike, um, which I didn't have for long on the road because I thought I'm going to kill myself on this or I'm going to get put in jail. Um, I went down to watch the last GP at... Eastern Creek and I was about 22 mm. and um, I watched the guys and I thought to myself I can do that so <laughs> I went home and ended a race at Oran Park yep. and that was the start of it I never rode again really on the road and just went went motorcycle racing so what was it about watching uh, Eastern Creek you know the race that uh, how did you know you could do that well I knew I'd done the background I'd, I'd ridden like since I was a youngster yep. and uh, I was as fast as anyone at motocross and I was as fast as anyone at dirt track yep. and that's the normal progression basically yep. so I thought okay I've just had a few years off that's all <laughs> about, <laughs> about 10 <laughs> so so you entered in Oran Park entered Oran Park and um, it's just like a, a state open meeting right so it was like C and D yep. so I win there I was, but I had a 750 and I realised that I was going the wrong way about it so I, I went back and traded that in on a, on a 250 Kawasaki a production bike, that's the the start level and um, that really brings out you know the riders, the, the craftsmanship and all the bikes are close and even so I realised that's where the competition was and I thought that's if I want to do this that's the bike I, I need to do so that's how it all started and from there you move up to 600 Supersport which is um, a great class and finally always in the back of my mind, which I wanted to race superbikes, which was happening here in Australia. Um, and finally, I did get to do that with Kawasaki in 96. So it possibly took around about, say, 92 to 96, four or five years. 
of spending all my money, which was not much, all of Kim's money, mm. and a dad helping us out, and uh, before I actually got a chance. And but I was a shy guy, country boy. I was like even walking past like Team Kawasaki Australia or Ansett Air Freight Suzuki. Like I, you know, I, I wouldn't even go in and say hello to anybody. I was, that's how shy I was. Like, but when I put my helmet on, I was like <laughs> a different character. In terms of belief, Troy, you, you know, you. It's you obviously had it deep enough in there to, to pull resources to lay other things down, you know, such as cycling, etc. You know, you, you had that belief, and so do you think that's the catalyst that allowed you to just unwaveringly keep going and until? Yeah, well, when um, it was in '96, I rode for Team Kawasaki Australia, and then I got offered a job, a paying job, which was very little, um, for like the NZ Air Freight Suzuki, and I was having so much time off work trying to go racing and trying to hold my job and then there'd be broken bones here and there it was sort of like cross between getting the sack and leaving so mm. I finished work and then I decided okay I'm I've got a job I'm making a little bit of money I'm just going to train like hell and you know that was 97 I finished third I missed out on a trip to Suzuka with a broken wrist I broke five wrists I thought that was going to be the my career over before I started I thought I just had weak wrists yeah but that wasn't the case really um but yeah i missed a, my first trip to suzuka eight hour which i always really wanted to do yeah and then the following year i rode for um like um back straight to europe straight to to the uk so it happened pretty fast once i once i got into a team and once you got into the world of once i got into the like the right side of it yeah, yeah. and do you think you know you've, you've mentioned your work ethic you, you know train like a madman you know phrases like that yeah. Don't give up, never give up. No. That was like the theory from David Tardozzi, who was our team um, in, most of the time in World Superbike. Basically, he was our um, team captain or yeah. whatever you want to call it. Yeah, yeah. But like he used to like just sometimes just grab me by the head and say, Troy, that's only light rain. Like, yeah. like didn't matter. Nice. That's like, I wasn't really rain. known as a crasher. Like, yeah. And when I did have crashes, like sometimes the bike wouldn't get damaged like that much, really. Yep. Um, but David used to put so much belief into me even when maybe you didn't have that level yeah yeah and that happened in 2006 um i won the championship i come back after a couple of years in marriage be which were a bit up and down um and said a jib now crashed at barcelona and um ducati asked me if i wanted to do the last race in gp and i hadn't ridden the gp bike since 2004 and i said i I would like to do it, but I, I, wouldn't, I don't want to do it unless I can take David, Paolo, Ernesto and the team that I had in Superbike, and eventually they agreed. We went there and, um, and I won the race, like, as a wild card. And so that was incredible, and, like, we walked away from there, like, the Superbike paddock with our head held high and, you know, knowing we could do it, even though in 2003 and four all I get was a few podiums, myself and Loris, and uh, it was hard times. Yeah, wow. So, so with that, because your, your motorbike, sorry, motorbike, MotoGP victory, um, that happened in what year? That was 2006. That was that race. Yeah. That was that race. Yeah. Where you took your team, superbike team. Yep. To the MotoGP. Yeah, who I wanted to take in the first place, but I wasn't allowed. I've got it. Yeah, yeah. got it, piecing it together. Yeah, wow. So that was another it's, moment, a defining moment in your career. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Everybody, nearly everybody thinks that's the biggest one, but for me, it was, I call 2006 was the best year. Yeah. So winning the World Superbike Championship and then winning the last race felt like a mini championship. Got it. Um, yeah, it's... And it wasn't like, see, told you so, but yep. it felt so good for us to go there and do it and knowing that we could do it. Yep. And before we went live on this uh, this interview, Troy, I asked you just, you know, as, as relatively uninitiated, the only time I've spent on a, on a motorbike apart from, well, two times, you know, mopeds in Bali on surf trips <laughs> was on a uh, little, uh, I think, uh, Kawasaki uh, little uh, Yamaha, sorry, um, Yamaha little show jumping bike as a, as a nine-year-old and I ended up breaking my jaw doing a jumping grafton mm. and so my parents a little what do you call that a little 250 uh what would it be no what would it be uh it was a little yamaha peewee P- 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 something peewee 50 peewee 50 it was. right okay a yeah, little bike yeah, yeah. A tiny baby one and right. i uh you know might have been, been younger than nine I, I remember i broke my jaw and ended up you know sitting in a class with back then they didn't do tension band wiring for the bones it was a full mummy 
yeah. you know, mummy thing with straws. <laughs> and so uh, my Might parents... Be wisdom tooth. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> parents quickly got rid of that. So uh, to the uninitiated and listeners as well, you describe the difference between MotoGP and Superbikes as... You could say um, MotoGP is the pinnacle. Um, you, that's like uh, F1. And Superbikes, you could say, is like uh, NASCAR or V8s or IndyCars. Um, the Superbikes are like... The difference between the lap time is to say Phillip Island, for instance, is less less than one and a half seconds per lap, but the money they spend in MotoGP to, to get that is a lot more, whereas the superbikes are like, they're a production-based motorcycle, but then they're highly developed. Um, but people can go and buy a bike that looks like the bikes the guys are racing in, in World Superbike. Okay. And what actually happens in World Superbike as far as all the... The racing and testing, uh, the electronics, they all find themselves, weight, feed themselves down into the production bikes. So even the production bikes now, like all the, all the brands like Ducati, Yamaha, Kawasaki, Suzuki, BMW, all, all them bikes now, like put a good set of tyres on them bikes and they'd be better than the GP bikes and super bikes of 10 years ago. Yeah. That's how far they've come along like in, over the years. Wow. So they're becoming more user-friendly to ride. Yep. Um, which is sometimes good for me. I'd rather see sometimes the old school racing where everything was like in your hand and um, the bikes used to look out of shape a lot more. Mm. I used to love that, um, where it was all more down to the rider rather than believing in electronics because you see a lot of crashes these days where things go wrong yeah. and it's um, to do with the telemetry or, or something weird, some sensor. Yeah, right. Yeah. Has there been a time in your career, Troy, where your commitment wavered, where you were like, you spoke about this unrelenting belief, you know, in yourself, which has had its uh, top-ups along the way with, you know, victories yeah. in MotoGP and, you know, the breakthroughs we've discussed already, but was there a time when you were really like, you know, I don't know if this is the end or, you know, I don't know if I've got it within me to keep going. Um, no, not like that. wasn't like that. But when, like I said, we had a plan and that was to stop in 2002. The problem was halfway through 2002, Ducati decided they were going to build a MotoGP bike. So the GP bikes used to be 500cc two strokes. The rules changed and they decided to make them four, like, um, four strokes. So Ducati decided to buy a bike, and they were, they had Marlboro backing. So mm. I couldn't say no. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yeah. I, that was like, I said, okay, Kimbo, this is a deal. Yep, fair enough. That's another two years. So we were there for another two years, and um, we believed the first year was really good. I had a couple of podiums and led a few races. Uh, Loris won one race, and everything was good. The following year, Ducati came out of a completely new bike, and we turned up at what well, we've seen it being developed and, and and so forth and we turned up at the um, the launch of the bike and we were all there and it just looked incredible and we turned up the first race and we were struggling yeah. so we both struggled right through the year and we only had like maybe two podiums I had one podium and Loris had two so somebody had to go it was going to be an Aussie yeah. so that was me and I was really upset because just because like felt like yeah. I got the sack. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I got offered a job back in Superbike, but I was that angry I didn't do it. And yeah. I wish I had it because then I would have had a chance to take Carl's. I would have had another year yep. to do it. To, um, so to I, take the records. Yeah, so I did a year on the Honda and then um, I had I crashed on my motocross bike training and broke my wrist really badly. Mm. And and I was struggling on that anyway with a Spanish team and great guys, but it just wasn't working. And, and I'd spent so much time on Ducatis, it didn't click with me. Um, and, a, and a loss of wrist mobility for you guys is... Yeah, is, is, being the left hand wasn't too bad. Yeah, okay. Um, but, like, we'd come up with a plan, like, yeah. after that and went, okay, I'm not going to finish the rest of the year. Yep. I'll sit this out, get better, and come back for 2006 on the Ducati. Yep. And I hopped back on the bike, which was a new bike at the time, a 999. Yep. At the first test in Qatar and just felt like I was back home again. Like it felt like I was sitting in my chair. Yeah, right. And right. I was like second fastest straight up, and yep. and and that was it. So I managed to swindle Kim for another year. <laughs> <laughs> and I, honestly, it was the start of two thousand and eight. Yeah. That before we actually even started, we told the press and everybody that I was retiring at the end of that year because yep. I knew that I needed to do it. Yep. And be- you needed to retire. Like I knew that I was like. Um, we need to get back back in. I, I knew that a plan. I just wanted to win that year, yep. and then I, was, I thought to myself, "I'm going to be happy." But also, 
um, our kids were, Mitch and Abby were 14, mm. and, okay, Monaco, South of France is all good, but I did, we didn't think it was a place to be long term. Yep. So there was a cross between me, okay, I've had a good career, been pretty lucky, I can get out of here in one piece, even though I knew I could keep winning for a couple of years. Yep. Um, it was a really hard decision, so that's why we made it early, yep. come back to Australia um, and put our kids in a good place and we've ended up here. Yep. Kids are in good schools, there's good opportunities for them here in Australia and I think they've seen enough of the world anyway. Yep. Um, yeah, that was our, in the end, that was what it was all about. Yeah, okay. So, yep. so that was how the career yep. came to a close. Yeah, yep. and uh, it was terrible. Like, you can say depression. Yeah. Like, uh, even for the first few years was really so hard for me and I always used to talk about making a comeback. And How uh, old were you in, in chronological years? 39. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, okay. And, and really for your whole, you know, for want of a better word, like professional working type life, yeah. you had been, you know, defined by your, your accomplishments and performances and all of a sudden that yeah. stopped. And, and true, I mean, I, you know, in my work, work closely with athletes transitioning off and out of career some by choice some not due to injury and uh to a you know a non-professional vantage point when i you know had my bike accident as a 19 year old you know kid who was aspiring to the professional triathlon ranks um you know i went through clinical depression um suicidal at one point as a young guy i just didn't know who i was and what i was doing and you know so so how did you work your way through that yeah it was tough like like you say like i just say for five or six years before that, all I had to do was ride a motorcycle fast. Mm. So I'd wake up, I could take the kids to school or, or be with the kids for a bit, ride my bike to the gym, do gym, ride home, get a massage three or four times a week. Like It was like mm. the best job in the world. Yep. I had like 20 or 30 people, like everybody everybody loved you. You got, you are spoiled, you got too much you know, everything was over the top. Yep. But I was like the, the guy winning and, um, <laughs> and I was basically world champ or 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 very close to world champ nearly every year yep and um so it's it's a weird situation um and to come back and it's like it's not really a big sport followed by australian people Mm. and i could have stayed in europe and basically been uh yeah but just it was so hard and um even so that was the end of 2008 i went i've been employed with ducati ever since though so it's it's been good um, the following year, I went to Phillip Island to watch the World Superbikes or just to be there with the team. Um, that was in February, so it was only like three or four months later. And I could hardly even walk into the box, just felt like I wasn't meant to be there. Really? Yeah, and um, I just wanted to grab a bike and be on it. Oh, I could, yeah. okay, got it. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. You wanted to be out there. Yeah, not, and just not, seeing not the guys there. all being um, like everything was for them when they're out there, you know, riding for Ducati, it felt mm. like, wow. It was like that went on for years, but now like I'm absolutely, uh, I'm pretty good with it, and uh, I love going down and seeing the guys, and we just have a good time. Yep. Uh, if I want, I can just ring up and we can go to Italy, and I can do. They can plan a test, and I can do a test, and yep. I'm back there in July. I'll do a bit of riding on the proper bikes, and basically that's they do that for me, like for me to put my needle back in the arm. Yeah, you know, yeah, have, yeah. The, have the test team there. And um, go and bust out, you know, a couple of days of tests. Yeah. And uh, sometimes I'll be close to the lap time, and I think, yeah, no, nah, don't worry about that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I did actually make a comeback. Well. Yeah. Well, I did a wild card. It was uh, last year. Yep. Twenty fifteen. Yep. Yep. And I was far from fit. Um, and uh, David Guliano was injured in the test on the Tuesday, so the race was, of course, Saturday Sunday. And um, the guys actually didn't ask me. They weren't going to put anybody on the bike. But I rang Ernesto, who was my chief engineer for many years. And I said, Ernie, like, get the bike ready. I'm coming. I've always been talking about this. I say, this is like, um, you know, we're just going to have some fun, get the gang back together. He said, if you really want to if you really want to do it, he said, okay, we'll do it. Like, just, and I said, yep, do it. So I went down there and um, it all turned out okay. I, I was sort of competitive and I was in the top ten and... Yeah. I hadn't been on the bike for a couple of years, you know, and like yep. it was uh, it was just nice to do and good to get out of my system. Yeah, and actually being against the guys and uh, not winning. Yeah, and then I David was out, so I went to Thailand and actually did a bit better there as well. Yeah, but then I realised that you know I didn't really want to do it, and it was it was good, but it was just great to okay get that out of my head. Yeah, and okay. actually good to be beaten. Okay, because at the end of two thousand and eight, I was in the 
or 2009 after I stopped, I, I was in the situation where I, I used to think to myself, I wish I had a got butt, beaten up badly so I couldn't ride rather than being in good shape and thinking I could still win. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, so do you have any regrets that you did call it off at that? that no, no. 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 Not now. No. No. But at, I used to, at the time. I, sometimes I think, you know, I probably could have won another two championships, yeah. but I could have been injured or, or who knows yep. and, so, and in your career you would have seen uh, some pretty nasty stuff yeah yeah definitely um, deaths def- yeah um, the Jerry Okato he was killed right beside me in Suzuka mm. in 2003 or 4 mm. um, which was bad that's probably the you know we weren't close friends but we knew mm. each other mm. but that was pretty pretty full on for me mm. um, yeah but you do see a lot of things and but generally, the sport's getting better every year. I think, as yeah. far as accidents go, and okay. it doesn't matter which sport you partake in, there's always a chance of a, a freak accident happening as well. Yeah, yeah. And Troy, um, bringing the interview into a close, uh, just a couple of questions left. Uh, who's one athlete that inspires you, whether it's currently or in your, in your throughout your career? Oh wow, I can't. I can't actually just name one. Like I really look at so many different sports and and. Uh, we say look up to or just have a lot of respect for the guys at the top of the game or trying to get to the top of the game and uh, it's hard to pick the ones because I'm involved now like with a, with a team and, and bits and pieces and you can't sometimes just people think you can pick because mm. you've been there yeah. you can pick who's going to do what but you can't because you don't really understand the guys and and things change so it's a hard one. Sometimes okay. it might be the person, you know, not at the top at the moment. That's yeah. just on his way, making his mark. And because yeah. uh, you're, you're, you know, one of the, your sons, your youngest son, Ollie, uh, he's he's getting around. Yeah, Ollie has a crack at everything. I mean, um, Ollie does like he's really fast on the bike. Uh, he does rugby and um, and MMA training, and he's in the perfect opportunity to be in the spot where. I can make a good pathway for him, yep. but sometimes I don't know if I actually want to see him do, especially mm. road racing. Mm. And so we'll see whichever yeah. way he goes. Yeah, um, yeah, and, and all the kids are, are going well. Mitchie's training, and he do, he's doing MMA, and Abby's in uni, and yeah, it's um, they don't have to prove anything to me. Yeah. Whatever they decide to do, I've seen lots of lots of kids come up. Like through, I know how sort of pressured I was along the way, and sometimes I think. It, it's good and bad, yeah. but it certainly can. Um, it's like we spoke about earlier. You have to be so dedicated, yeah. like to a, just to be on the crazy side. Yeah, like people actually won't believe what you do to win. Yeah, it's like they just don't believe you. Yeah, what's the craziest thing you ever did to win? <laughs> oh God, just rode fast basically. <laughs> but I mean, as far as like the training and and like hopping back on when you're injured and yeah, having to be yeah. helped off the bike. Yeah. Um, there's so many times where I could barely, barely, you know, walk rather than race. And then sometimes, but that's what all the training and, and all the preparation is about. So when you do get hurt, yeah. it puts you in a better state of mind to, to be back on. Yeah. And I think that the thing that I had going for me really was whenever I had a, a crash or accident, yeah. I understood what it was for. Like, I've had teammates in the past, I'd come in and I'd say, oh, I don't know what happened, and, like, I didn't do anything different. Yep. And then they hop back on the bike and they find it hard to go fast again because they don't understand why it actually happened. Okay. Like, I used to be able to hop back on and and, and go straight out and maybe put it on pole. You had already recognised the yeah, errors behind what it. actually happened. You'd learned from the mistake. Yeah. So what would be one bit of advice, Troy, you'd give to people who are out there seeking their best physical performance? Uh, what's one In bit their of advice? chosen sport, basically. Correct. Yeah, I think it's... It is such a difficult one to look back at where I was, being an apprentice spray painter, um, and then finding my way to where I am now. It's like a Cinderella story. Yeah. But like people have to believe in themselves. Yep. But you have, like I say, I didn't fully believe in myself till till later on in my career. Yep. But I had the want. So you, the want you can never take the want away from anyone. Yeah. But you have to want it so bad. Yeah. If you don't want it and you want, don't want it more than anyone else, it's not going to happen. Yeah, wow, wow. And Troy, uh, what's on your bucket list outside of your, or both inside your sporting career, which is still very active, you know, on, on the bicycle? Uh, bucket list. Bucket list sporting, bucket list life. Uh, bucket list life, I've been around a bit, but basically um, 
I'm, I'm happy here doing our bits and pieces and going on a holiday every now and then. Um, this year, I'd like to win uh, the Australian the Australian Super Motar Championships, which is up at Cairns, if I decide to go. Uh, the Cooper Classic, which is in Kempsey, which is a big oil track meeting. Uh, that's probably about it for this year. Yep, so I train myself up for them. Win a couple of A-grade races on the bicycle out at Narang or Pimpamara somewhere. Yep. I'm just starting to get myself back fit. I qualified for the World Masters Cycling Championships in Perth probably six weeks ago. For 2016? For 2016. Come on. The problem is that conflicts with a um, super motard race down in Newcastle for me, so... It's well, a difficult what's, one. It, what's it going to be? In, in, in Troy, you do have a classic as well, right? Yeah. The Troy um, Bayless Classic. Yeah, we started a race in my hometown. It's actually where I did three years of um, dirt track riding at Old Bar. Um, it's very, it's getting very big. We'll be in our fifth year next year. We have like uh, this year, I think we had seven or eight internationals come over. It's basically like if you can win that race, you could call yourself world champion. That's how we look at it. It's really hard. We've got the fastest guys there possible. Um, now, Troy Bayless Events, we take on and look after the motorcycle exhibitions here in Australia, which um, keeps Kim more busy than me. I'm pretty much hands-on, but um, Kim and our business partner, Mark Peterson, um, yeah, it's, it's great. The good thing about that is people have always known me about being just a Ducati man, but now we're in line with, with all the manufacturers and we're here to try and help uh, motorcycling grow here in Australia. So the exhibitions are great. They're always good. We're looking forward to our next one in Melbourne, which is around the 23rd, 24th, 25th uh, of November. Uh, we always put on an event down there as well, just do a bit of racing, and there's always some action. Great. So where can listeners find out more about uh, the Troy Bayless World events? Uh, well, basically, the Troy Bayless Classic, the exhibitions, you can all find at um, TroyBayllisEvents.com. TroyBayllisEvents.com. So .com, yep. listeners will link that up in the show notes. And Troy, where can listeners uh, find you in, in terms of social media space? Uh, social media, yeah. Um, basically, Troy Bayless Athlete page on Facebook, Baylistic21, I think it is, on uh, Twitter, and probably the same, I guess, on Instagram. Instagram seems to be the one going forward these days. Yeah, it certainly has a lot of attention, doesn't it? Yeah. Baylistic, is that a is that a nickname from the... Yeah, the, when I was younger, like, uh, like those? in the Aussie Championship, like, a lot of guys used to call me the can opener. <laughs> <laughs> because, like, the first corner, I would, I would, like, put it up the inside and just make room. And then somehow it got to uh, Baylistic. <laughs> oh, wow. That, that's, a, that's a strange nickname, uh, is it? Is it? Is it art isn't it to the development of a yeah, nickname yeah for sure well Troy Bayless thanks so much for taking the time and I know all the listeners will enjoy this one and uh, certainly um, personally wish you all the best for the events you've got coming up and um, mate just think you're uh, an outstanding example as you said of what you know some self belief um, and uh, despite the starts where we start people get where they can get to with yeah. their, their endeavours so mate thank you very much Brad thanks mate thanks for having me and I want to say um, thanks to everyone out there listening and uh, wish you guys all the best so there you have it i trust you enjoyed this episode of the physical performance show what an incredible career troy bayless had if you enjoyed the show i'd love it if you could jump over to itunes and leave a review reviews help enormously in making this show more visible and able to be enjoyed by more people who just like you are pursuing their physical best performance. If you have any questions or comments regarding today's show or guest, please shoot them over to my Twitter account. You'll find me at Brad underscore beer. Coming up in next week's episode of the Physical Performance Show, I have a fireside chat with a running vet and a very fast one at that. This runner went on to claim Australian representation in the Glasgow 2014 Commonwealth Games. She's also been the head vet of Australia Zoo. Yeah, Australia Zoo. Steve Irwin Zoo. So you're going to enjoy that episode. Be sure to tune in next week. Until next time, keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer, and this has been the Physical Performance Show.